and welcome Mr. Dane Atherton, ladies and gentlemen. Bring him up. Great guy, Rick. Thank you for that. <laughs> well, I might as well be talking about superannuation after that. Might, might as well. Uh, Ten tips to uh, improve your self-managed super fund. Take you back to a very boring subject, but I, I'm very passionate about real estate and really uh, watching that presentation and just that pyramid um, is just a great, uh, you know, we, we can just transform that back, back into our business um, very, very easily. Um, hands up if you've been to a real estate conference before, if I could just ask that show of hands. Okay, how, how many have been to five, ten, hundreds, too many to remember? And I think, you know, what I love about this concept is it's not about, you know, real estate people telling their stories and, you know, here I am, I'm great and I did this and now I'm doing that. It's really about concrete concepts, scripts, dialogues, things that you can take back into your business and apply them. But I think uh, most, um, you know, speakers worth their salt will start by saying, hey, if you don't apply things and you don't change things in your business, then, you know, really coming along here today has been, you know, has been a bit of a waste. Um, uh, working with uh, many salespeople now, my previous life just very quickly was training, travelling around to many seminars, auctioneering. So I'd come to a session like this and then I would leave. Um, and now I've bought a real estate business, so I don't leave. I turn back, uh, you know, come back in the next day. Um, so one of the real uh, delusions that I suffered from is that you do a training session, people would go, oh, that's fantastic, um, really great concepts, and then you'd assume that everyone would change. Um, after my first sales meeting or training session in my own team, um, I came back the next day and realised that human nature is change isn't that easy. Uh, so I'd come back and think, well, yeah, how good was that? That's fantastic. Great wisdom, great knowledge. Next day, nothing had changed. Um, so we really had to work at that. Um, what I find, uh, you know, looking at many different salespeople, particularly in our business, is that this concept of seeing the big picture and understanding the way not only the world works, but understanding the way the real estate world works, I think can give you a, an immense amount of power. Has anyone ever met anyone that's a little bit negative and maybe you've got, I know no one here would ever be negative, but maybe there's someone in your office, don't mention who they are, especially if they're sitting next to you, but it's almost like a misery contest around the coffee machine in the morning. Has anyone got one of those people in their lives? Don't put your hand up if they're next to you, okay? So, you know, you meet them in the morning, how are you going? Really bad, it's tough, there's no stock, you know, and they're always complaining about something. You know, we had, we've had a similar sort of thing in our marketplace where I've had one of our guys saying, oh, I missed that listing, why didn't I get it? And I said, well, have you ever met the people? No, I haven't. You know, so the, the alerts come through on realestate.com and, you know, it's in her farm area and she says, why didn't I get that listing? And I said, well, I don't know, why didn't you get the listing? Do you know them? No, I've never met them in my life. So why would you expect to get the listing? Because of my profile. Because I, you know, because people know who I am. So that's a little bit delusional, isn't it? That's not the way it works. And you actually drill down at why that person got the listing. It's always a relationship. It's always either a referral or they met them somewhere along the way and they've converted that listing. So this concept of understanding how it works, this misery concept that people have, I think comes from not understanding the way it works. You know, there's no point getting up in the morning and saying, hey, the sun's rising in the east, my house faces a you know, different way, that really sucks, I wish it was different. You know, vendors, when they list their property, typically want too much for their homes. Is that the same in Sydney? I mean, it's pretty much the same, isn't it? So working, you know, getting angry about that when you've got an offer in the first week and they don't take it, I just don't see the point in getting angry about it. And one of the great analogies and, and, um, and metaphors that I, I always come back to and um, you know, it, it, was, it came from a motivational speaker, who, you know, the late and great Jim Rohn, was the story about the frog and the scorpion. And this story to me helps, helps our team and helps me understand and just accept the way the real estate world works and, and the world works so you, you can control the controllables. Has anyone heard the story of the frog and the scorpion? Okay, well, most of the room hasn't. I'll tell it. I'll just pretend it's mine. Okay, so I'll just pretend that I made it up. So it, the story goes that the frog and the scorpion go to the riverbank, and you know the frog comes up next to the scorpion, and, and you know the scorpion says to the frog, "Hey, look, I can't get over the other side. Do you mind if I get a lift? You know, jump on your back, and you can get me over to the other side." And the scorpion, you know, you know, sort of cheesy grin says, "Come on, mate. You know, they're Australian." He said, "Can you? Can I? Um, you know, can I have a lift?" And the guy goes, yeah, the frog goes, mate, I'm not an idiot. Just don't, you know, 
I'm not going to... You're a scorpion. Scorpion sting frogs. That's just ridiculous. And I'm not going to do it. Come on, mate. Please, just... I've got to get to the other side. You know, I, you know why, would I, why would I sting you? It just doesn't make any sense. Frog goes, well, that's fair enough, I suppose. You know, jump on. Gets to the... Uh, you know, halfway over to the other side of the river. And guess what happens? You know the story, don't you? But you're just guessing. So guess what happens over the... Halfway over the other side of the river, what happens? The scorpion stings the frog. They both die, so they both drown, and they're now sinning in the lounge room awaiting judgment, okay? Between, somewhere between heaven and hell, and they're in the lounge area. So they run into each other, and the frog is filthy. <laughs> you know, he is absolutely filthy. And he turns to the scorpion and he says, Mate, he looks looking down on the, on the world. He's got his froglets there and his wife, and he's, he's never going you know, to have to wait a long time to see them because he believes. So, you know, the thing is, he, he's looking at, at, at what he's missing out and he cannot, he's, he's, most of all, he's angry at himself. He turns to the scorpion and he wants an answer, doesn't he? He's so frustrated and he says to the scorpion, why? And the scorpion's answer is, it's in my nature. You have heard it before. It's in my nature. So, it's just, to me, this is so powerful. It is so powerful from the point of view of, a seller wants a lot for their home. At a listing presentation, where we, you know, the way that we structure a listing presentation is that if all the evidence is at 600,000 and they're at 800,000, to me, you know, bursting that hope bubble and saying, hey, you know, I want 10 grand in marketing to get you down 200,000 in price, how does that sound? It doesn't really, you know, it doesn't really, it doesn't really work. So understanding the way it works, everyone's got a God-given right to want a premium price for their property. This is just an example of a hundred different ways you can apply this. So work with it. The other thing is, if stock's tight, typically speaking, the marketplace is good. Is that a fair call? You know, very rarely do you have stock being tight and then you know, no one wants to buy anything. It's tight for a reason. And this has started to creep into our business because when I first bought the business you know, 18 months ago, whatever it was, stock was abundant. I mean, hey... You could, you know, we had one person turn up to an open home, we'd be over the moon. And if we had two people come to an open home, we'd, be, we'd have to call in reinforcements. We were just overwhelmed. <laughs> you know, so, so the thing is, stock was tight, but the buyers weren't, weren't anywhere. So now what's happening is the market's getting better, a lot of transactions happening. And, you know, now that stock... So what were people complaining about in our business 18 months ago? There's no buyers. You know, this is crap. Um, the market's terrible. I'm going to move to Sydney. We didn't have anyone do that, but, you know, I'm sure they thought about it. And you're, you, you're also thinking, hang on, don't come here because there's, you know, stock's tight. So we're, now we've got people saying stock's tight. So they're complaining about the very thing that they wished for. It's the byproduct of a good market, isn't it? So rather than, rather than get angry that stock's tight, be thankful that your market's healthy and then work out how you can get more opportunities. I mean, it's just got to work with it. It's like 18, you know, 18 months ago when we came in to the Gold Coast and, you know, we sort of over-exaggerate how bad the market was because we did well. So we say, oh, yeah, it was tough. It was tough. But the reality is, is that the, the number one skill that actually got us a return in that marketplace was seller education. So we got excited about seller education and we created a system where, break it down, you know, I love that, you know, that process, not outcome. We just created a, a system where we actually, you know, focused on the things and the activities that were going to get us a reduction in expectation, which is what? I mean, can anyone guess what that is? Yeah, auctions, but what, what, what's the actual fundamental activity that needs to happen between you and a vendor to get their price reduced? Communication, about what? The market, the market what? Feedback, which is what? Price, exactly. So when you drill it down, people say, talk about the market, talk about feedback, talk about, no, you actually have to talk about numbers. So you actually have to have a conversation about numbers to a seller to educate them. Because how many times do you hear agents say, oh, they know. They don't bloody know. All right? They'll only know when you tell them probably 10 times. It doesn't just happen overnight. So I hope that helps. Remember the story of the frog and the scorpion because I believe that's a really great metaphor for accepting the way things work rather than getting upset about you know, the, the, the byproducts of the very things that we wish for. Um, the other thing is, has anyone ever seen, I mean, I know he was in Melbourne, has anyone ever seen James Tosterman speak? How awesome is James Tosterman? Like the Alyssa Camplin of, um, you know, of real estate, just an absolute guru. But I'll tell you what happens sometimes that I see. People go and see a superstar like that 
and then they come back into their business all fired up after a conference. Has anyone ever seen this happen? Maybe you've had it, you just experienced yourself. Now, I think we've got to be a little bit careful with this, is that someone goes and sees an elite performer who gives you know, 120%, huge sacrifices, hugely disciplined, and has arrived at that position of skill and discipline over many, many years of, of refinement. And then we go back into our, now most, no one in this room, but most real estate people, not us, are ill-disciplined. That might shock a lot of you, right? But most of us are, we're sales people, um, but no one here. So what happens is, they take an ill-disciplined mindset after a conference, and they go back into the office absolutely fired up. And when they're back into the office fired up, has anyone ever seen this happen where they go back and say, hey, I've been to you know, Ideas Exchange, I've seen, I'm, I'm going to write a million next year, and I'm going to get a Ferrari, all right? <laughs> now, I did 50 grand gross com last year, I'm still driving my mum's car, but don't worry about that. <laughs> I'm, going to, I'm, going to, I'm going to crank this up and I'm going to fire up, okay? So, if we're a plane control, I'm going like a dramatic 100, I'm basically turning the thing around and I'm going like to another country here. I'm not going to Sydney anymore, I'm changing, I'm just, I've got to change so much. So they get in there fired up, okay, they, get, they go to the receptionist and say, hey, make me up a sign, a stop sign saying stop on prospecting, laminate it please, quick, put it on the front. Okay, now get me, um, you know, get me some ACDC Thunderstruck to warm up, okay, bang, I'm ready to go. Okay, give me, give me the phone list, okay, yep, ready to go, I'm going to make 100 calls by 10. Tom Pennell says 10 by 10, no, 100 by 10, let's go. Okay, give me a coffee. Turn the air conditioning down a bit, please. It's a little bit... Okay, let's go. Ready to go? Do you want to come for a smoke? Yeah, no worries. Let's go. <laughs> no one here would do that, right? So how committed are we really? So the, the, the lesson there is don't try and do a radical 180 degree change from what you're used to. Just make solid commitments. You know, it might be, it might be an hour a day. It might be half an hour a day. But just make solid commitments. Because the reality is... It's the old analogy of, of uh, and I'll, I'll take you back to, uh, you know, the best metaphor, I think, tr uh, relating back to uh, success is weight loss. You know, how much money is spent on weight loss um, paraphernalia, shakes, ab rollers. Has anyone ever come home drunk, you know, and bought an ab roller? <laughs> you know, so, you know, you, you, you're so pumped over here and you're going, okay, this is awesome. I'm going to, but the reality is, if I said, what's the formula for, for getting fit, what is it? Eat less crap, do exercise. Okay, so that's, that's really what it is. Okay, so the thing is, we know that. But fitness first, right? I call it fitness first syndrome. Fitness first rely, what's their most highest enrolment time? January. Okay, so they put an extra star. So they, you know, they over subscribe. So they rely on our discipline. Their business model relies on it. So, okay, so January, everyone goes, okay, I'm ready to go. Same as the James Sosterman syndrome where they go, okay, I'm going to just fire up here. This is going to be so awesome. I'm going to be shredded this year. Um, oats, skim milk for breakfast, black coffee, um, and you know what? I'm just going to do the boxing class. Then I'm going to do the, um, the jazz aerobics class, and I'm just going to do everything, body sculpt, pump. So I'm just fired up. Okay, so lettuce and spring tuna and spring water. Don't know olive oil. I'm having that for lunch. So at the end of the day, how do I feel the first day? I've strung it together. How do I feel? Feel like a drink. But you feel, you feel pretty hungry, but at, the same, but at the same time, you do feel a little sense of pride. And let's say you can get, I don't know about you, but the night time kills me. So, you know, you get through the night, right, where you don't have, you know, chocolates or whatever, and you wake up the next day and you go, I did it. And then you've got to go and do it all again. And let's say you defy human statistics and you string a second, second day together. <laughs> what do most people start to look for after that two days of full-on unbelievable torture? Results. So what do they do? They rip the shirt off, go to the mirror. <laughs> I feel amazing, right? This is going to be awesome. This is bullshit. <laughs> this isn't working. Okay, now what, is that, what, is that, what the hell does that have to do with real estate? Let me put it to you this way. You're fired up, you need stock. Okay, so you need listings. Most of us here, the feedback I've had just around the, I won't say urinal, but the feedback I've had around it is stock is tight. Is that fair? So your need for stock now has nothing to do with the way that it works. 
Has anyone ever had that happen? You know, where they knock on a door and say, hey, hi, I'm Dane Atherton, and I've just started prospecting, you're my first one, are you guys ready to sell? No way. Yeah, you wouldn't believe it. We had a dream last night, we're ready to go. <laughs> Because most, idea, most people's idea of door knocking is what? Should have hoped they're not home. <laughs> but, when, but when you do knock on the door, what do you normally get? When you do do a lead generation activity, what do you normally get? No, not ready yet. Which really means what? Go away. Go away. I'm not ready yet. Why do they care about your market report and all that? They don't really care. They just want, you know, they just want to meet someone when they're ready to sell. Really? But at the same time, your job's to be there before that, isn't it? You know, so, you know, your job's to be there before that. So, you know, what we've got to look at is the way that the, that the business works is not about, okay, going straight for the jugular, you know, that espresso, um, you know, instant sort of let's just, get a, let's just get a sale or a listing today. It's about meeting these people 12 months in 12, you know, over a period of time. So that's going to take time. Just because you have no stock now or limited stock now doesn't mean the, that the process changes. But you can turn it around a lot quicker than what you think. But at the same time, your expectations have to be long term. You know, you've obviously got activities you can do now. So just be aware of that, that you're not you know, shortchanging your future business in six months because you're expecting you know, abs overnight. You know? So just be really careful of that because you see so many people now, you are now the result of what you did or didn't do six or 12 months ago, you know, or even two or three or five years ago, or even 90 days ago. You know, so if you want to change your stock base now, it's not going to happen overnight. You're going to have to have a lag period. And that's just accepting the lag period is just, there's a lot of power in it. There really is. Okay, so everyone in this room is where they are because of what they already know and do. Learning what you don't know and don't do, you might already know it, but you don't do it. I mean, I'm, I've got no doubt in my mind, is anyone brand new in real estate? Okay, so there's, there's really a handful, you, you are the sound guy, um, there's, there's really audio visual as well, sorry. The, the, um, the people in this room, most people know how to get a listing. You know, how to, you know how to get yourself in a position to get a listing. Is that a fair call? So, you know, you know how to do it. So don't look for the magic bullets. You know, where, you know how to do, do the actions and get the rewards. Um, but the thing is, the old stop doing list, you know, the, um, the age of distraction. We live in such an age of distraction. We, we're get being pulled over here, we're being pulled over there, we've got text messages, we've got all these sorts of things happening that we've just got to be so careful that we don't um, you know, get, get away from that dollar productive activity because our job description has not changed in many, many years. It hasn't changed. Prospect, negotiate, list, sell, that's, it's not going to change. You know, that's just what we do. So. The, the, the point I wanted to make on this is that many people, you know, in discussions have reached a level of comfortableness. And I'm not, you know, I'm not being too full on there, I hope. I'm just saying that you have a chat with someone who's been in real estate, say, 10 years, and they say, oh, all my business comes from referral. I don't need to do that database stuff, or I don't need to nurture all your, your reports, and I don't need to improve that because all my business comes from referral. So how many listings have you got right now? Two. So all of that came from referral. Be careful that you're not telling yourself that you've already arrived. You know, be careful that you're not telling yourself that. When a plane gets to cruising altitude, it's easier. There's no doubt when you become an attraction agent, you've got a database of a thousand or more people who know, love, trust you, and you know, you've got profile, you've got stock that creates stock, you're a market leader, it becomes easier to generate. There's no doubt about that. But what I find is that's 30,000 feet. Most people get to 10,000 feet and think they're at 30,000. So they level out too, too quickly. They stop that exertion. They stop building. They stop growing. Be careful that's not you. I want you to just close your eyes for a second. Okay? I'm not going to touch you. It's all right. So close your eyes. Put your hands in the air and visualise you jumping. No, I'm only joking. So close, close your eyes and I want you to remember your first day in real estate. Can anyone remember their first day in real estate? So how are you feeling? I want you to get right back there. This is regression. I'm going to have to get you out of this before we finish. But what's your first... How do you, you remember your first day in real estate? You're smiling. That's good. Was it yesterday? <laughs> okay, so your first day in real estate, how do you feel? Give me some words. Confused? Okay, that's cool. Overwhelmed? Excited? Yep. What else? 
I'm a guy, okay, I hope not. Maybe. So excited, a little bit of little bit of fear, which is good. Anyone remember their principal? Maybe it's your first principal now. Did you listen to them? And what do they tell you to do? Cold call, which is what? Prospect. Guess what you did when you first started? Guess what you did? You prospected. Guess what happens when you prospect? Get stock. It's amazing. So what happens then? You get stock. What happens once you've got stock? You sell them. And then what do you have to do again? Prospect. And then we come back here and someone's going to say, keep doing it. Don't stop. And I think this is what happens is that people, when they start, they're hungry because they're excited. They have to be. They're humble, so they listen, they do the basics, and they have some success. Most of us, otherwise, we wouldn't be here. Then what happens is we sell everything or we experience a period and we go, okay, well, you know, I used to door knock, I used to cold call, and I used to follow up after opens on Saturday afternoon just to be different. I used to do all that stuff, but I've got a BMW now, right? And I don't do that anymore because no one with leather seats door knocks. We just don't do it. <laughs> And then we have this cycle of the Dolly Parton curve, which we've all seen. You know, is that familiar? And people go, oh, where? so the thing is, you would think that that little bottom part would be a good place to be. <laughs> but it's actually not, is it? Some of, you, some of you are there right now. So how do you, look, I think the big message with that is stock from stock. So use your stock as a vehicle to generate more stock. And, you know, I've got a bit of a list coming up. But the thing is, sales are the result of the job. You know, I love to hear, loving, love hearing that this morning about the, you know, the um, process, not the outcome. You know, the results. The best quote I've heard in a long time is, "The results are none of our business; it's the actions." So control the actions, and the the, the sales appear, don't they? Sales come from having the stock. You know, the go go right back to Vinny. Who owns it? Fly you fly over Sydney, you can see the roofs. We know, where the, we know where these people live, right? So you go, okay, there's the roof. I can, I can at some stage with technology find out that person's name and if I can't, I can knock on their door. I can do all those things and then I can meet them, introduce. So it, when they become a seller, I do a presentation. So I've got to be a sharp presenter. We know that. That's not going to change. Once I've done a presentation and then I get the listing, get the right marketing, get it reduced, it sells, I get paid. The, the very end of that is sales. And we celebrate sales as if, oh, how would you do that? Well, I did it 12 months ago when I met them. You know, that's where it really started. So let's celebrate that activity. So, you know, when I was watching um, that pyramid, you could probably add some more stuff to this, but let's just keep it really simple. This is your plan to get from, you know, where you are now to where you want to be. You know, are you world class at prospecting? Are you world class at presenting the listing presentation? Are you world class at seller education? Um, you know, if you want to learn how to present, talk to someone in a super competitive marketplace. You know, talk to someone in a super competitive marketplace. If you want to learn how to educate, talk to someone in a diabolical marketplace. You know, talk to me 18 months ago, where we had to be really, really great at that skill. Now, there's no point being really great at that in a marketplace where that doesn't matter. So you've got to you've got to adapt. For example. If you're on the Gold Coast, you need to educate sellers. But if you're in Sydney, you need to be able to present well. We have to be, now I'm not saying we lower our standards, but the reality is, I reckon John Cunningham's team could present better than our team. I reckon just generally speaking, that would be the case because that's how you have to be in your marketplace. You've got to evolve and you've got to change, you've got to, you've got to work with it. So I mentioned that before, instant gratification is the number one killer, killer of dreams. You know, same with listings as I, as I touched on. You don't ring up someone and say, hey, are you ready to sell? That doesn't exist. You know, there's a process. The grape matured into some barrels, tested, stored, whatever it might be. There's a complicated process involved, but that's what you come out of the end. Um, I just put this up here as a visual. If you're listing a property without marketing, with a price, doing an open, selling it in the first 24 hours because the market's good, how many people did you not meet who are future sellers, which is, the, you know, which is the first point, but how do you know there's not more money on the table? So that, that's a metaphor for a listing. You can put the rod in the water, yep, you'll get, it, you'll get a fish. Okay, so you put a listing on the net, one website, list it with a price, you'll get a result, and you'll tell the vendor you're saving them money, that's great, good for you. 
But the reality is, if you want to get the most, most amount of money, you've got to have all those things. And the byproduct of having that marketing mindset of marketing property loudly is you meet more people. And when you meet more people, they're on your database, so on and so on. A huge percentage of agents' listings come from their current listings. You know, so working that, um, it's a magnet. Are you using your current listings for magnets for future stock? Are you doing that well? Is it just a process? We've got a listing in an area. There's other, agent, you know, other agents listing on the market in that area right now. Are we inviting to the open homes as a comparison to meet them? Are we doing all those things? How do we strengthen the magnet? Invite your neighbours to the open home. Invite the on the market to the open home to compare with this. Invite your database. Give your open homes for sellers. Smile, connect. Follow up database everyone who comes in contact with you. Advise them when it's sold. Basic stuff. But do you have a process written down to make sure that it happens every single time? Uh, and do you take responsibility for that rather than relying on your principal to say, hey, how come you guys don't print this off or print that off? Take responsibility for it. We have to make a number of sales before we get paid. And my final thought, um, rapid fire session here today, is you know, when you get a listing, we've got to be very careful that we understand what the actual reality of our job is what we've been employed to do. Has anyone ever run, you know, been in the supermarket and run into a seller that they didn't sell for? Anyone ever had that happen? What do you find yourself doing? Hiding. And you know what is really interesting, and I know you guys wouldn't do this, but I always love how seller, uh, agents say to me, they're really nice people. You know, they're lovely people. I love these people. They're so lovely, these people. They're really interesting. They're really nice. I really want to do a good job for them. And the way I look at that is this, right? <laughs> this is a bit vulgar, but I'm going to do it anyway to make a point. Have a look at that. Watch, watch that. What's, going, what's, what's happening here? Isn't it cute? It's beautiful, isn't it? What's happening there? There's a connection, isn't there? Isn't it lovely? You excited? What's the reality? What, what's the purpose of this? That's what it's about. So when you get a listing, I know, I know that's full on, make a point, right? And the point is, we're not there to collect rabbits, we're there to do all the things we need to do to get the end result. Not in a way that leaves them, you know, uh, you know, you know unhappy, but sometimes the unhappiness must precede the happiness. Sometimes the tough love must come first. And getting out of the listing character and into the processing character is a really important part of our business. So the listing character is, pick me, I love them, they're lovely people, they're awesome, this is great, I'm awesome, I've done everything, you know, we'll work together, we're, you know, this is great, I'll get my database through. Now I've got the listing, now I've got to be the character to actually deliver the service. It's like BDMing and property management. Chase the business, now I've actually got to service the business. Okay? Does that make sense? So, th th you know, my, my purpose here today was to give you some real quick, I won't leave you with that slide. Um, <laughs> My, my purpose here today was, give you, was to give you some quick fire, you know, um, you know just mind changing concepts so you can look at the business a bit differently and then we've got to go back in there and make it happen when we leave here today. You're going to have some great scripts, great dialogues. One final script which I think is great that we're using at the moment which I think is just working really well. When, where do most offers come from after someone, you know, from, from a buyer? Is it after the first, second, third inspection? Like on average, where would it be? First inspection, do you get most of your offers? Second. It's second, isn't it? Because sometimes when it gets third or fourth, it, they start to overthink it. So what we're doing now is we've gone from when we follow up after the first inspection, we're moving away from saying, do you want to make an offer? Which is sort of how we were taught. So our question now is, hi, how are you going? John Dane Atherman calling from Harcourts Coastal. You went through the property on the weekend. Just wanted to see your thoughts. Any interest there at all? Oh, yeah. Next question, would you like to see it again? So what's happening, they go and see it again. Our odds of getting an offer go up dramatically rather than just trying to close for the jugular. So I'll leave you that question. Enjoy today. Thank you very much for your time. Really appreciate it. Great job, eh?